Welcome to About the Winelands. In this show, we'll be chatting to leaders, influencers, wine producers, restaurants, winelands businesses, and other role players. Tune in every Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday for our latest episodes. You will find us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram TV, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, and Spotify. Good day, everyone, and welcome back to About the Winelands. Today, I'm talking to Kathy Brewer. Kathy is from um, Valera Wine Estate. She's the sales and export manager and also part of the family business. Hi, Kathy. How are you? Hello, Will. I'm very well. Thank you. Thanks for spending the time with us. I know you must be busy. I'm always happy when the, when the topic is wine. Yeah, wine is the topic. So, you know, Valera, can you tell us a little bit of the history of the farm and um, your family on the farm? Yes, sure. Um, the Greer family bought Valera in 1983. Um, at that point, it belonged to an Austrian gentleman who was um, not, and the brand was not that well known in South Africa. And most of the wine at that stage was exported. Um, and then, you know, there's sort of no big secret as to how Valera grew um, in the mid twenties, my generation of the business, when we were in our mid twenties, that was our generation ended up with this wine farm and it was fairly run down and it produced around 4,000 cases of wine. And I'd say our success is due to many hours and lots of hard work from our extended team. We had a lot of fun along the way in building our brand. Um, and there was also a lot of luck and good timing too. Jeff and Simon basically started everything, my brother and my cousin, and I joined in 87 with my computer background and I left that business and I went and studied food and wine at Prue Leaf in London. So in the winter months, I wrote a, a program to look after our mailing list and all of that. And in the summertime, I cooked uh, tapas style lunches and champagne breakfast or you can't say champagne, cup classique breakfasts. Mm -hmm. And our biggest break really came with meeting Jean-Louis Denois, who came from the Champagne region. And we had a 10 year royalty agreement with him. And that's how our bubbly started, which is mostly what we're talking about today. Um, no one would have known that the brand we started then called Tradition would have grown into what it is today. Um, and yeah, becoming one of the top uh, bubbly brands in South Africa. Well, that's that's amazing. Um, you know, it's, it's a what a change from doing spreadsheets in one season and cooking tapas in the next, right? <laughs> that must have been quite. So, so which is your favourite pastime, the tapas or the spreadsheet? Oh, uh, neither really. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now my husband cooks everything, and the spreadsheets are done by people that are much better at it than me, and I've. I look at a computer today and I can't believe that I used to work with these punch cards and feed them into this huge massive thing that took a, a whole, took up a whole room. And now we're talking to each other on, you know, podcasts and Zoom and all these fancy things and I'm feeling a bit lost, but I manage. I, I, I prefer the people side of things and the marketing and you know, meeting good people, talking about wine. So more the marketing and the sales than the computer and the cooking side. Well, that's, that's awesome. So you, you, you mentioned the Champagne region, what a, what a lovely place to visit. And, um, you know, to have, a, to have a, a, a license from somebody there it must have been, you know, just a dream. Um, you're, um, you know, you said bubbly um, now, everybody's talking about MCC. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about what you what you're doing at Valera and and you know how this become the driving force in your business. Yeah, so um, Cup Classic is for sure our driving force. It's about forty percent of what we do, um, and it's we've continually innovated this area because you can't just stay in the same place. So we've now in, introduced. Uh, Zander Greer, who's our nephew to this category, he's, he's looking after our Cup Classique production. Jeff Greer, my brother, was the one that really got it going. Between him and Jean-Louis, I think we've looked at every category and we can 
continually do look at it because otherwise you just get left behind. Quite interesting. So um, where are, your, um, uh, are you selling worldwide? Is your, your customers mostly South African or what is, your, what is your split between exports and the local market? Our local market is strong. So we're 80% local. You wow. know, with, uh, with bottle fermented bubbly, it's not so easy to get into the export market, although the Capital Seek Association are trying very hard to, to lift the category. Because, you know, here we can give incredible value, top quality Cup Classic, which no one really from outside can compete with. Um, once you get into the export markets, you're looking at the lower end champagnes, which come into our price category, and um, they've marketed themselves so well. And then you get Prosecco, which is not the same thing because it's not bottle fermented. But it's it's capturing the imagination of the young younger crowd, which is also good. It's getting them drinking bubbly. Um, and Carver from Champagne, I mean Carver from um, Spain, and you you just got a wide range of things. And Cup Classique is just one small little dot on the on the map. So we have to work quite hard to get that recognised. But it is coming, and there's a lot of good quality Cup Classique being produced at the moment. Yeah, I think that's that's exciting that it's coming, right? I mean, I think um, you're right. The, your 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 younger people are, you know, the new market. So that's going to be interesting to see how that um, is changing. But um, yeah, it's tough competition from the French in in Champagne. They've always been at the forefront of marketing ideas and really um, pushing that. Um, you have a footprint in France um, called uh, Domaine Grier. Can you tell us a bit more about this? Yes, now um, the main Greer is in the Roussillon, which is in the uh, south of France, is in the foothills of the Pyrenees. Mm -hmm. And it also actually happened because of Jean-Louis Denois, who introduced us to Babli. And he'd always, he phoned um, my brother the, in December in 2005 and said to him, you know, there's this piece of land with your name on it. You, you've always promised you'd come and do something in France after all the years he'd spent here in South Africa. Um, and so uh, Jeff flew over there and just fell in love with this beautiful patch of land with Syrah, Grenache, Curring Young. There were some, the youngest vines there are sort of 40 years old. So we're looking like a, a, at a serious piece of vineyard in a beautiful climate, which we used to, Mediterranean climate. And the guy that owned it was going to take the Euro subsidy and get out of the wine business completely. Um, and so basically all we had to offer him was a little bit more than what Brussels were going to offer him. And we ended up with a wine farm in France. Um, and yeah, I, I think our, our success there has really been with Rosé, which is not what we were planning to do in the beginning. It's a Grenache Carignan blend. But, you know, if you make a classic French Rosé, people know what they're looking for. Something minerally with good fruit, not too alcoholic dry. Um, in the South African market, the category is a little bit more confusing. You're not quite sure whether it's going to be sweet or dry or fruity. Um, and so it's become our top seller, especially at Woolworths in South Africa. And we, we bring over quite a, a bit at a time. And I have to say that Woolworths is by far our biggest customer. Um, they also take a wine called Lacca Duc. Um, in the area we are, there are these beautiful old Cathal castles and Aqueducts and um, the Lacca Duc is named after Aqueduct near to our vineyard and it's a blend of Syrah, Carignan and Grenache. And then we have a Chardonnay and a Merlot. We bought two hectares of Merlot near to our original vineyard, which basically all goes, goes to Woolworths. And then they, they have a Grenache. On Valera itself, we also have a Grea Brut, which is a, of course we had to go there, make a, a bubbly. We're the only one in that <laughs> little region that does. It's made from Macabo, which they most in Cava in Spain, uh, Carignan and Chardonnay. And then we have a Odyssea, which is all about our journey to France. And um, that's a Syrah Carignan Grenache. We have a, a, a premium red called Olympus, which is made from 100 year old vines and that's Syrah and Grenache. And then we have a, a, a white called Alba, which is Grenache Gris and Grenache Blanc, very unusual from old slate soils, very low production, 
quite special. Wow, that sounds amazing. So, you know, that's quite interesting. Um, South Africans buying French wines. Do you think that is a market that's going to grow over time? Um, you know, I, South Africans are very loyal to locals. So it's a niche market. But we always say it's not so foreign because it's owned by South Africans. <laughs> well, there's also, I suppose, a price issue always, right? Ex ex imported wines are always much, well, traditionally been more expensive than, than local stuff. Yeah, fortunately, we do bring it over in uh, full containers, which brings the price down. Mm -hmm. And we also have, um, you know, euros on this side. And because we're exporting as well, it helps us to bring the price down. So it's, it's very good value. Oh, that's that's awesome. So, in terms of the other thing that I want to talk about is, you know, um, sustainability and the environment. This seems to be such a hot topic these days. And, um, you, you know, you guys are also uh, quite um, involved with that. So, uh, what are you doing in terms of sustainability and also environmental awareness? Well, thanks for bringing that up because this is a very important part of Valera um, and what we do. Um, you know, there's two sides of sustainability. There's the environmental side and then there's the people side. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we've been, we have many different projects. So I'm just going to mention some of them. We can't go into detail on all of them because we've got a rainwater harvesting, we've got solar power, we've got um, we've got a, a indigenous tree planting project where we planted hundreds of thousands of indigenous trees, which basically make up for all the carbon that we emit in making our wine, and then some. And um, and then we have a wildlife sanctuary on the farm, and that I'll talk about now more. But we also have the Pebbles Project, which is a um, non-profit organization that's based on Valera and it looks after thousands of uh, kids in the winelands, the education and health side of um, of their lives and it's really made such a huge difference but you can look up the Pebbles Project, it's just something amazing. And then with our wildlife sanctuary, um, we basically have an area on the farm that's not really that suited to vineyard and we decided to return it to its natural state. Um, and the, you know, the environmental part of our business has become more and more important to us and to our customers as well. I mean, some people actually seeking us out because of our whole sustainable environmental credentials. And so it's becoming more and more a part of people's lives. And the Wildlife Sanctuary is a big project. It allows us to show visitors firsthand what we're all about in a way that they won't really forget. Because if you come here for a two hour game drive and then you go on a wine tasting, you, you will remember it. So it, it adds a lot of value to the tourism um, part of Stellenbosch. Um, and apart from game that we've introduced like Giraffe, Hemsburg, Bunterburg, um, <laughs> Wildebeers, Kudu, many, um, there are 130 different bird species, um, some of which were facing extinction, extinction, like the blue crane and the secretary bird. And I think it's just because, it, you know, if you've got a big area like that, it becomes a safe haven um, to a large number of animals who then come there naturally, not, not something you've introduced. Like we've got lots of Cape chameleon. So really, you just need to come there and we can explain it and show it all to you. And then at the same time, we can, tell people about all our other projects while they go on a game drive through the through the vineyards on their way to the wildlife sanctuary. I love it. What a concept, um, a, a vineyard game drive. I mean, uh, just there's nothing yeah. you can't love about that. So, Kathy, um, if you, I mean, you, you have a lot of visitors on your farm and, and sometimes the public, you know, are not always aware of, of in, environmental issues and stuff like that. That like they should be. If you have a tip for somebody visiting the wine, and what's the one thing that you would say they can do to to you know to actually help with um, sustaining our environment? Well, they then they I suppose need to think about recycling and um, not bringing bottles of water in plastic and 
discarding them. It just becomes a way of life. Everything you do, you think of. And I think this whole coronavirus has actually made people more aware of all of that. Although, mm. you know, things have become more and more packaged, I've noticed. But <laughs> hopefully, that's true, right? <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, that, that's just a temporary thing. So, so it's interesting you're mentioning the coronavirus. I mean, everyone has been forced, you know, to rethink their business models. And um, do you guys have any changes or new ideas in mind on your side? It's difficult because we've been thrown into this and you all become so busy trying to fight the fire. But I think the logical thing to do is to cut out areas that create a lot of stress and time, but add very little to your business. Um, and these could be wines, for instance, that you put a whole lot of effort into and they don't really sell because they're wines that people aren't drinking anymore or they're wines that there's so much of that you're just fighting in a big pond. Um, or we might change the way we manage our taste room. I mean, we were talking the other day about, you know, those the, the dispensers so that you don't have too many people handling bottles it, we might not go that way but there's there's lots of different things to think of where you might have spent a huge amount of effort for very little gain and i think those are the kind of things that will probably uh cease to exist after this time um yeah and then i think we i think everybody's looking at putting um, more effort into direct to consumer business but there you need to be careful that you have your logistics sorted out because that has become such an issue and you'll see a lot of complaints on a lot of direct um, websites where orders have been taken but the delivery hasn't been fulfilled in a proper way but it was exceptional circumstances so i think people just needed a lots of patience i think i'm um, also in that regard don't you think that uh, your your couriers and and you know that type of businesses will come to the party over time as more and more deliveries start happening yes, for sure and a lot of them had to adapt very quickly they had to double the size of their warehouse and you know it's it's, it's one thing getting a whole lot of new drivers that's easy but then the picking and packing and keeping up with all of that is mm. and having to keep social uh, uh, distance from each other and and minim minimal staff, it's not so easy. No, it's been it's been a challenge. So talking about challenges, I mean, you you've had a, a long wine journey. So tell us what is your what is what's personally the biggest thing that you've learned from your wine journey? Uh, I suppose I've learned that you never know at all, and you have to be flexible and listen to your consumer. And it is vital to look after quality across various price points. I mean, you can have a, a less expensive wine that over delivers. It's still, you know, quality in that particular price point, um, which Valera is quite well known for. And then I think, I suppose, you know, I've discovered that there are a lot of great people attracted to this industry. I've met wonderful people all over the world through, through my um, journey in wine. And then I love wine, like Lisa. <laughs> I agree with her. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so, <laughs> talking about loving wine, now I have to ask you, can you give us your own um, wine quote or your favorite wine quote? You know, now I have to bow to the superior talent of people like Winston Churchill and, <laughs> and Madame Lily Bollinger, because I'm not so good in that area. <laughs> Uh, as a, uh, you know, whatever I say sounds a bit corny when it comes to quotes. You know, I'd say something like, a glass of cup classic a day keeps the lockdown blues at bay. That sounds a bit corny. But especially if it comes out of a magnum. As long as your group is more than four people, we don't want to encourage drinking too much. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> you know, I've, 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 you, mean, you mentioned um, um, Bollinger and, um, you know, the other, you know, the ladies have always, the ladies of Champagne, or the widows of champagne seems to be the the marketing expert. So, why do you think our women so um, uh, good at marketing champagne? Is there a special reason? I think because of its sense of style and you know just the the feeling it gives. And I mean, if you look at if you think of the quote, I've got Madame Lily Bollinger's quote next to my desk. I'm working from home. 
And she says, I drink champagne when I'm happy and when I'm sad. Sometimes I drink it when I'm alone. When I have company, I consider it obligatory. I trifle with it when I'm hungry. I drink it when I am. And otherwise, I never touch it unless I'm thirsty. Now, I mean, how's that? That came <laughs> from a classy lady. <laughs> that is amazing. So I, I, I love that. So you, you were talking a little bit about Lisa and, and the Magnums and, and, and stuff like that. Um, I, we, we, I mean, Lisa is running this uh, Biggest Beautiful campaign in which she's really promoting Magnums. And in your case, you are guys are making MCC in, in Magnums. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the Magnums you're making MCC? Yeah. Um, well, basically, you know, Capital Seek, when it comes to a Magnum, is a lot more festive and it gives you a sense of occasion and it's also for those that are expecting something a little bit more from their bottle of cup classic they should really upgrade to a magnum you know and a magnum stays stays useful for longer so for those wanting to collect magnums they can do so and keep it for 10 years if they wish if they can um it the magnum kind of slows down the the, um, the aging process, but also when you put yeast and sugar inside with your base wine and put it into a bottle, which is how you make bottle for me, it's sparkling wine, you put a crown cap on the end, the yeast eats up the sugar and generates CO2, and then the, leaves, the yeast dies off and falls to the bottom of the bottle because it's lying on its side. Now, if you can imagine, a Magnum has a much bigger surface space than a 750 ml bottle. So there's more space where that leaves or that those dead yeast cells are in contact with the body. It's a process called autolysis, where that character of the yeast is imparted into the bubbly. And so, um, especially in Magnums of bubbly, more so than still wine, there is a bigger difference. And um, it's just more complex than a 750 ml bottle. So if you've got enough people together, why not open a Magnum? Well, why don't they open a Magnum anyway, Casey? <laughs> <laughs> I think um, that's quite interesting. So your 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 um your size of the actual neck and the and the and the is 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 that the same as so your your area with which opens is the same size as a so a one and a half liter bottle has the same neck neck size and and cap size as a as a 750, right? Yes. So basically, um, you've got twice the amount of wine to that small, uh, what they call the eyelid, the, the, the neck part where there's oxygen in. Mm -hmm. So that's why they say it's a, a slower aging process over time because it stays fresher longer because there's less oxygen. I don't think that makes as much difference as the, the contact with the lees part. Though. Oh, I see. Personally. So, I mean, in Europe, it's become quite fashionable, um, uh, you know, to take magnums um, of wine and, and also obviously magnums of, of bubbly um, everywhere. Do you think this is a fashion that's going to, you know, something that's going to uh, spill over to South Africa as well? Um, it's, it's quite slow in South Africa. So we don't, we produce magnums in smaller quantities we have tried it with still wine but it's also our fault a bit because you know our sales team have got so many wines to sell that they tend to forget to push the magnums mm -hmm. and um you know in, a, in an online shop it's also difficult because you can make the fact that you've got magnums available um where we tend to see them selling is for weddings and and big events things like that where it it just looks impressive and grand to have this magnum mm -hmm. but i think if people had to if if the producers put more effort in and show people side by side the difference between a bottle that from the same vintage that's done in a magnum and done in a 750 ml especially quite a few years later then you then you can see the difference more clearly then it might, but it'll, it will only take on with a small portion of the population. The other, the other category that's popular in Magnums is the is the less expensive category because then, you know, you're opening. Then it's for practical purposes because you've got a group of twelve people and you're opening a Magnum. You don't have to worry with opening three bottles when you can just open, or four bottles when you can just open two. 
No, that's true, right? And it's also mm. less, less, less stuff to carry. Person can carry two mm. bottles. You're carrying enough wine for, you know, you, otherwise you've got to carry four bottles around. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's quite interesting. So, yeah, that's what we say, you know, big is beautiful. So, um, Kathy, uh, how do people get hold of you guys if they want to order something or want to visit you? Well, all our details are on our website, which is valera.com, V-I-L-L-I-E-R-A.com. And, you know, our phone number, our email address is all on there. At the moment, um, we are we are open for click and collect. So if people order and pay, they can just come and pick it up in our taste room or they can just drive in and place their order. We obviously are careful with how many people we allow into the taste room at any time, but there are areas outside you know, undercover where they can sit and wait if there are a few people in the tasting room or we'll just bring it out to their car. We've got mobile uh, credit card machines. If people don't feel like coming into the taste room, we can just load the wine in their car and they can pay in the parking lot. <laughs> so we, we're trying to be very flexible. Um, and then, of course, you know, in Cape Town, we do our own deliveries. So any orders that are placed, we pretty fast about delivering them. We've got our own delivery guys. Our game rangers at the moment aren't working because, well, they are working, they're delivering and helping out with taste room duty um, because we, we can't do game drives right now. So everybody has actually been involved in, in packing wine and delivering wine. In Johannesburg, we have a, a warehouse where we have a, a, a group of drivers. It's not just Palera, there's a whole bunch of other wines there. But the, the, they were a bit snowed down for, for a couple of weeks, but they've caught up now. So deliveries will be quite quick from there. And then the rest of the country, yeah, then we use couriers. And okay. um, I think the couriers have caught up now too. So everything's not back to normal. There'll never be, it'll be a long time before it's normal. We, have, we now have a new normal, as they say. Back well, to a new normal. <laughs> that's true. Well, at least, you know, if you really want to... Uh, 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 Valera, and I think but that's that's why it's necessary to take a magnum. Did you, at least you know you get enough. You just click and it'll be delivered. Do you actually um, deliver the magnums as well? Yes, for sure. Okay, awesome. Kathy, it's been such a pleasure talking to you, and it's it's been yeah, fun. Thanks. Thank you for spending the time with us, and um, our yeah. listeners will appreciate the information you've given. So yeah, thank you very very much. No, it's my pleasure, Will. Thank you. Thank you for supporting our show. If you would like to get more exposure for your business, please have a look at our sponsorship options. Thanks again for supporting About the Winelands. Please follow us on YouTube and on our social media channels. All details and links are in the description.